All right, so good evening, everyone. I am truly so thrilled to welcome you all tonight to our inaugural Martin Luther King um, Jr. Lecture. Um, I am also so touched to see so many of you because I recognize that it is a Friday night. Um, so I, I just really am so touched to see so many of you show up tonight to honor Dr. King's legacy of social justice and equity. Um, I'm going to introduce, or I would like to introduce our Dean, um, Dean Erica Friedman, who has the wonderful pleasure of introducing our wonderful speaker tonight, Dr. Noel Mayendo, but also has some opening remarks to share with us. So uh, Dean Friedman. Thanks, Dean Hernandez, and welcome everyone. As we near the end of Black History Month, we should reflect on the crucial contributions of Black Americans that should be highlighted and celebrated not only this month, but all the time. We should recognize not only those who have been in the spotlight, the activists, authors, artists, and leaders, but all Black Americans for their courage, resilience, and contributions to making our country a better place. Understanding the history of Black Americans is essential to understanding our nation and our world. I wanna thank those who have created these spaces for us to honor Black lives. We owe many thanks to Lynn Hernandez, Caliris Salas Ramirez, and the Inclusive Excellence Council, and many others for the time and energy they've invested in organizing these events. We have established this event to honor the life and legacy of one of the greatest figures in American history, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King was a champion for justice. His courage challenged the morality of our nation and shaped minds across generations. Our hope is to encourage CUNY School of Medicine students staff, faculty and alumni, as well as our greater City College community to build upon the courageous activism of Dr. King and to increase awareness of present day avenues to advocate for civil rights through community action and scholarship. In honoring Dr. King, we affirm our own commitment to the goals of peace and racial justice to which he dedicated his life. Let him inspire us all to fight to dismantle racism in our institutions and prevent the perpetuation of social, health, and educational inequities. Our inaugural speaker, Dr. Noel Maniendo, is the new chair of the Community Health and Social Medicine Department at the CUNY School of Medicine. He has had a breadth of leadership experience in medicine, epidemiology, and population health that dovetails with the mission of our school and the teaching and research interests of his department. In his previous role at the New York City Department of Health as the Assistant Commissioner of the Bronx, Brooklyn and Harlem Bureaus of Neighborhood Health, he developed and implemented strategic approaches to advance overall population health and well-being using a racial equity and social justice lens. In his previous capacity as an Assistant Commissioner in the Division of Mental Hygiene, he spearheaded the design and launch of 10 citywide mental health initiatives. Prior to joining the health department, Dr. Menendo served as the Senior Director of Community Health and Wellness at the National Urban League, where he led national health programming and policy efforts across 36 states and raised 4.4 million in federal foundation and corporate funding for the league's initiatives. He is an incredible addition to our community and will speak this evening on advancing health equity and social justice through community health. Welcome, Dr. Menendo. Thank you very much, Dean, Dean Friedman. Um, and really, and uh, Dean Hernandez, thank you very much for having me as the um, speaker on this, this inaugural uh, uh, um, lecture of this lecture series that is, is a really big deal. And I'm really grateful and honored to have been uh, invited to, to do this. Um, and I thank all my colleagues, um, the students and others who have joined, alumni who have joined and who will be joining. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna jump right in. So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, so today's topic is uh, advancing health equity and social justice through community health. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Manindo, uh, and I'm excited and grateful for the opportunity. Uh, history matters, words matter. And uh, there's a quote that is attributed to Dr. King uh, that there, there is some, there's a, there's some, dis, there's a, a little bit of disagreement on the language that he actually used. Um, what is commonly 
uh, referenced and, 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 and used is, the, is one that says, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Um, but uh, you know, when looking at records, uh, there were no, there are no traceable records of the actual speech itself and the exact words he used. But uh, the AP uh, reported on this soon after, I think a day after he had presented at, uh, at a conference in Chicago. And the quote that they used uh, is, as the, is, the, is as follows. He said, we are concerned about the constant use of federal funds to support this most notorious expression of segregation. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. I see no alternative to direct action and creative nonviolence to raise the conscience of the nation. So that was the part of the of the of his present of his speech uh, where this is the quote that he gave. A few weeks later, there was a Cleveland uh, newspaper that uh, altered the quote somewhat to include healthcare and inhumane. And why is this important? Uh, uh, as you'll see in the rest of this presentation, one of the keys uh, we strongly believe, many of us who are in this work strongly believe is in order to advance health equity and social justice, we cannot be ahistorical. We must be uh, very clear on history. And, and, and in this particular case, the, the difference between in the, uh, health and healthcare is, is, is important. What, I don't, what we don't know is in Dr. King's own mind, if he was making that specific distinction, but I think we all know from the focus that he had on housing and employment and income, inequ income equality and, 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 and many of these other issues that we now call the social determinants of health, um, it's clear to us that in his mind that it, would, it, would, it, it was probably a connection, of all, a connection to all of these things that was he was referring to, as opposed to just healthcare in the sense of healthcare delivery. Uh, health would include healthcare delivery, but health as we understand it now in the context of community health and health equity is the social determinants, the structural determinants. The other thing is the, the use of the term inhumane versus inhuman, inhuman. So inhumane, as we all, we all know, is, is, is sort of reflective of not being, it suggests a lack of, 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 of empathy and compassion for suffering, uh, whereas inhuman uh, speaks to something much more egregious, something much more, uh, something much more severe, uh, and 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 really speaks to dehumanizing uh, and denying the humanity of 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 people. And uh, and the last bit of that is that it often results in physical death. So of the, of the, of all outcomes, of all outcomes of, ina of, 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 of inequity and of racism. Uh, whatever the sum total of those resulting in physical death ought to be something that is is of great is of grave concern to to everybody, uh, regardless of the field that you're in. But I think that's a really important thing to to, to note because he wasn't just talking about suffering; he was also talking about how it impacts on people's lives. The last thing I'll just point out is he also talked about direct action and creative nonviolence. And so there was really this approach. Uh, to, and, and it, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the last, the last uh, years of his life, the focus on the poor people's campaign uh, and really pushing for decent jobs and income and the right to a decent life, the dignity of people, the dignity of human, of human beings and, and the dignity of all human beings. And the idea that uh, the right to vote uh, is obviously critically important, uh, but the weight of it and the power of it is lost when people don't have the ability uh, to, due to systems and policies and environments that have been created to live the fullest life and, the, uh, and life free of, of, the, of the pangs and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the vitriol and the viciousness of poverty and discrimination and all of these other factors. So just really pointing that out and many of you have seen this image before just sort of uh, showing a depiction of the difference between equality and equity and what what that means in terms of the investment of resources the investment of 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 uh, of, um, of of bringing 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 equity as opposed to just sort of equality making sure that uh, we are looking at the spectrum of where people start and where uh, where they find themselves in this in the social continuum and being able to bring uh, a level of justice 
a level a leveling of the ground uh, in that sense as well. So if we were to look at health equity and we have to look, we need to look at the root causes of health inequity. Um, and this really comes down to the long and complex history of racism in this country. So uh, racism is a system of power and oppression uh, that structures opportunities and assigns value based on race and fairly disadvantaging some while fairly advantaging uh, whites. So people of color, uh, are, so th there's two ends to this, there's two pieces to this. It's not just the floor, it's also the ceiling. It's also uh, where advantage is created and racial privilege and supremacy. Um, and if you looked at the spectrum of time uh, in this country, the history of this country, uh, you'll see that it's really in a more, it's really more recent that we've even begun to have structural, legislative, constitutional basis to really push, for, to be able to really even advance the work that we've been trying to do, that people have been trying to do for very many years. It was formally, institutionally, uh, constitutionally uh, built into the history of this country. Um, and this is racism at all levels. So the internalized racism, the interpersonal racism, institutional racism, and structural racism, all of these things. Uh, and it's really, it's only really, really been a very short period of time in the arc of history that we've really been able to, that we're in the phase that we are. But this also means that we can't have complacency, even with where there has been progress. We can't have complacency. We, the, the, the notion that um, racism uh, is this, um, is this uh, thing that's fading away and it just isn't there, it isn't the same thing anymore. And you know that, that notion must be dispelled. And it, it, it is and continues to be very deeply rooted in, 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 uh, in the society. Um, so looking in New York City and how, you know, how health inequities play out, uh, to be, from the perspective, the perspective I'm bringing here is as when we look at uh, racism in this country, in New York City in particular, you'll see, we'll see that a lot of it plays out on the basis of, of, of residential neighborhoods. Um, New York City is one of the most unequal cities in this country, uh, but all of our cities are unequal. Is also uh, uh, racial inequities outside of cities in this country, certainly. Um, but for the purposes of this conversation, uh, just looking at New York City, I think it's important to go all the way back. So this is a, this is a map from the New York Public Library that looks at, um, you know, it's funny, a lot of people speak about being native New Yorkers. And, uh, you know, the, the Lenape people, uh, the indigenous people of what used to be the island of Manahata, uh, who lived in this uh, before the before colonization uh, by the Dutch? Uh, though the the Lenape people are really truly the the native New Yorkers, if we were to really consider that, and it's important to recognize that they still do exist. And this is a this is a nation of people, um, and uh, constitutionally they are a nation of people. And the, this this is this is also their city. But the, the map is showing you here the, the tip and the, 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 the southernmost tip of Manhattan, the, the, the almost straight uh, line uh, coming from the top of the island to the bottom of the island is the wall, literally that became Wall Street. Uh, that this was the, 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 the tip on the right-hand side you're looking at is, uh, is the, the Dutch enclave where commerce was happening, trade was happening. It was built by enslaved Africans. Uh, who were uh, uh, brought in to, 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 to build up this area. Um, and the, the, there was constant tension and turmoil between the, 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 the Dutch community and the, the colonizing Dutch community and the Lenape people, indigenous people. But when African, enslaved Africans petitioned to have uh, land that they could you know, you know, build homes and Grow, uh, grow crops and you know engage in commerce and do things uh, you know that they, they would you know the things that they would like to be able to do. There were apportioned land that you see those green sort of enclaves over what is now like the Lower East Side, um, and those areas. The plan was that they would serve really as buffers. They would serve as buffers between the Dutch community, the Dutch colonizing community, and the Lenape indigenous community. And this was in 1661. This map is a depiction from 1661. And this just sort of shows you the origins of uh, racial segregation and the, the allocation of, of, of resources uh, based on race. And 
in, in, the, in the places that people live, in the places that people work, in the places that people are, are raising families and so on. And so not to mention the whole idea on one hand of being colonized, the, 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 the indigenous people, but also the enslaved people who are enslaved uh, against their will and brought in to do this uh, work. So this sort of gives you an early starting point uh, into how this has, um, this how, how, how racism has entrenched itself in New York City. Uh, I was assistant commissioner and most of my work, I was based in Harlem, uh, in Eastern Central Harlem, West Harlem, and doing work in the upper Manhattan area. And so I like to really focus in on the co key communities, taking East Harlem as an example. Uh, so, you know, one of the large communities uh, by, uh, by percentage of the population in East Harlem is the Puerto Rican uh, pop population. And it's important to understand the ways in which that came to be. How did these neighborhoods become to be how they are? And so this is just a, a snapshot of the story. There's a much more. Uh, there's a there, there, there's much more to the story. But going back, this is a this is a clipping from 1898. Uh, this is after the Spanish American War and uh, the uh, America uh, Spain was defeated. America took over the territories of uh, Philippines, of uh, Puerto Rico, and, and other places. And as a, the, the, one of the first waves of migration was a result of that trauma, of ma that man-made trauma of war. Uh, uh, and a lot of people um, more fled uh, uh, the island of Puerto Rico and moved to mainland USA. And at that time, the island, of, there were still immigrants. Uh, uh, citizenship rights had not been granted yet uh, to uh, the people of Puerto Rico at that time. And then, uh, you know, 1921, post-World War, uh, one, uh, the Jones Act came to be, uh, came to be, and partial citizenship rights were granted to people from Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, but when I say partial, you know, the, the political determinants of of health, including the right to vote and to choose who is running the country, uh, that was denied of the people living on mainland Puerto Rico. Uh, and so they, that, that's a that, that's a, a key example of how. Uh, power shifting happened and power dynamics happened to sort of create a, a, a certain, uh, 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 create these inequities that we see. And this is another clip in 1947. There was another wave uh, of immigrants uh, after World War II. And as if you look at the, the sort of the, the story here in the, in, the, in, the, in the Times, they're talking about, you know, uh, state, city, city authorities are, are worried about uh, 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 about this, this, this influx of uh, uh, Puerto Ricans is they are thinking about issues around housing, health, and if you read more about this, you see that there were these concerns about hygiene and coming with infections and diseases and things like that. And a lot of that is the is language that keeps repeating itself, keeps echoing itself through the course of history, uh, particularly around health. So when we think of in the last few years, we heard uh, at the national level talk around. Um, caravans of, of, of people coming from Central America and coming with diseases and coming and, and they're rapists and they're, you know, criminals and they're whatever. And just sort of the, 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 the things that we've heard before, the, the, the making of these effigies of human beings and turning them into these, um, we, we, you, they're carriers of disease and they're unclean and, and, and that sort of thing. This is a thing that sort of uh, and these communities were landing um, in places like East Harlem, other parts of the of the city, uh, and even other cities uh, in in Miami and Chicago and other places. But I want to quick do a quick diversion here to speak about in the 1930s. Uh, somebody called uh, uh, Cornelius Rhodes, and uh, he was a, a physician, Harvard trained physician. He taught at Harvard uh, for a while, and then got involved with uh, in the 1930s. There was this whole idea about anemia. Uh, and the impact of anemia on just productivity, economic productivity. So of course, we had just come through the, the Great Depression uh, and there was just this thought about how from a public health standpoint, you know, is, is anemia, um, uh, uh, is, is that a cause of, of some of the things that we were seeing around economic uh, productivity? And so the, the Rockefeller Institute had a global health institute, uh, a global health initiative, and he was sent as part of that initiative to Puerto Rico to study that. And so he was there for a few years and his, his time there was cut short uh, by, by a scandal, by, by a scandal. And so he, he um, you know, I have, I have quoted there some of the things that were in a letter that he, was, he had written to a provider, a, a colleague in New York, 
Uh, and he was talking about Puerto Rico and he was saying it's a beautiful place, but the problem is that it's full of Puerto Ricans and they're dirty and they're thieving. And they're one of the most worst races that inhabits the planet. And the best thing for Puerto Rico would be to totally exterminate the population with a by tidal wave. And he's talking about, you know, he's already started some of that. And he, he's, I've killed eight of my patients and I've tried to transplant cancer into 13 more, although none of them have died yet. And he later, so this was exposed uh, by Puerto Rican nationalists. Uh, it was put in the media and it was exposed and he was pulled back. It was a great embarrassment for the Rockefeller uh, Institute. It was not fully investigated at the time. Uh, he was protected by a, gov a government cover-up. Uh, and he continued to have a, an incredible career. Uh, and, and he, you know, in cancer research, he was credited with developing, um, you know, elements of chemotherapy, key elements of chemotherapy and how they ended up being very helpful and useful in the treatment of cancer. He was also involved in developing of mustard gas uh, with the U.S. Army uh, as, a, as a biological weapon. But um, in 1979, the American Association of Cancer Research renamed an award after him that they had named in 1979. Uh, in 2002, the, the, the whole scandal came up again. They reviewed, uh, they did an investigation. Uh, they concluded that, you know, he probably hadn't done the things that he said he was doing, uh, going to, uh, he had done, uh, but that it was offensive enough to where they renamed the, the award that they had named after him. Uh, and uh, they, they, they stripped him of that, of that, uh, of that award. So the, the, the point I'm bringing here is just, you know, as educators of medical, as future medical providers, uh, all of this sort of ties in. Uh, medicine has a long history of being involved in some of the most vicious forms of racism and inequities. And it's, it's, it's easy to sort of, there's a book called Medical Apartheid, and there's uh, several other books that you could look and look at and read and sort of get a really good sense of the history of this. And it's important to know because the training of physicians comes with a degree of privilege. Uh, privilege for the educators who are doing it, but also privilege for those who are receiving the training. And as they go out into their careers, um, society assigns a certain level of privilege uh, and prestige to that. And Oftentimes, that is that's, uh, that sort of gives a pass, uh, and where you know there are many other examples uh, where uh, there's not been the accountability, and people have been elevated and made to be great. Uh, and the father of gynecology, J. Marion S uh, Sims, and the work that he's done, and and yet meanwhile, not really until recently acknowledging uh, that you know he was experimenting without consent. Uh, on 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 enslaved African women, and not just without consent, but often without uh, anesthesia, and just uh, doing all kinds of multiple surgeries, just really butchering uh, and and torturing uh, our people. And so, just there's a way in which that has to be a thing. Uh, and I say this to any students and alumni that are on, uh, on uh, who are listening here today, uh, that check check yourselves, but also check your colleagues. Uh, that privilege. Uh, can be a very, very vicious thing, can be a very dangerous thing. And so when I said this, just bringing this into the context of my talking about the Puerto Rican population and how they came to be in East Harlem, and just thinking about how trauma, intergenerational trauma, and, and layers of it just had a role in the experience, the lived experience of the people that you see uh, when you're in East Harlem every day. Um, and the same thing, another, another big, uh, uh, community, a big uh, uh, population within East Harlem is the African-American community. And if we think again about how they came to live in East Harlem, uh, you, know, you have to go back to uh, post-Civil War and, and, uh, and, uh, and the advent of Jim Crow. And Jim Crow, as we all know, wasn't an actual person. Jim Crow was this, was this effigy, this, this, uh, dehumani this, 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 this insult of an effigy that was created to sort of to 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 give a picture to uh, what it and, and and drive the fear of white people uh, so that the the actual laws the segregationist laws uh, had a had a had a had a, had, a, had a clear sort of image to it uh, and where white people would not want to you know you don't want to have your children going to school with these types of people. Uh, and we should listen very carefully for that type of language. The last few years, we've ha we've heard that 
language. We've heard the language around Mexicans being racist, rapists. We've heard the language around those SOBs talking about black athletes. We've heard the language around these types of things. And, and this was just, you know, in this was in just the last few years. And so these things are, are bubbling under the surface of our society uh, in the country that we live in. But it's important to note that while it started out as these segregationist laws, it, it, it morphed very quickly into a form of violence, a very dehumanizing, intensely violent, intensely dehumanizing form of, uh, of racism. Uh, and it, it, it prompted uh, uh, the single biggest migration of people in the United States, uh, of people who, and these were people that fled the South. So this is the great Northern migration of black people and, and the different uh, uh, branches of that migration, including the big, uh, the big group of people that fled Northeast into New York and Newark, New Jersey, and then from there North into, you know, uh, New England and various places in, in, in New England. And this came, so there was, there was also the pull factor of industrialization taking place in the country and uh, available jobs as a lot of white men who had been gone off to fight in the various, in the, in the First World War, um, and so there were there were vacancies there, just economic opportunities. But the real push behind this was the was the the the, the racism and the the violence uh, that was taking place at the time. Uh, the the brute the brutality, the raw brutality of this. And what's really sad is uh, so this here is an image showing. Uh, I believe this is at uh, 134th Street and and, uh, and and Adam Clayton Powell uh, in, in in Harlem. And uh, this is one of the landing sites uh, where people were arriving, registering. They were also landing and arriving in Hell's Kitchen. It was also a black enclave at that time. Uh, and uh, certain parts of Midtown around what is now the Madison Square Garden and places like that. And then people might move up to, uh, to Harlem um, uh, in, in the years that followed. Um, it, was, it was really unfortunate that even after fleeing the South to come North, uh, you know, the federal level policy started to change to bring all of, a lot of that segregation and racism in policy uh, throughout the country. So the federal code, uh, starting with Woodrow Wilson in particular, um, and then from there it just sort of kept layering up. And so uh, one of the the, the 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 policies was redlining, and this is uh, this was a policy, uh, and many of I'm sure all of you have heard of this. So this this was redlining was a policy uh, that that was tied in with the Federal Housing Administration. Uh, and when, um, uh, when decisions were being made around where to make investments uh, in housing, um, decisions were made uh, where, uh, you know, the, the assessments were made of the different parts of the city and where, uh, and so this was done, I believe, in about 250 cities across the country. Uh, and, you know, the color coding was essentially, as you can see on that on there, uh, so green coding was the best places for investing, and red coding obviously was the worst. And uh, this was the red lining we speak about. And so the um, the 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 and, and as as federal policy goes, so does the private sector oftentimes. So even private lenders sort of just went along with this, and 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 they promoted this. And this is how it was that a lot of investment didn't happen in some of these neighborhoods. And if you look at Manhattan in particular, you'll see Eastern Central Harlem. That red, that red lined area, you'll see the Lower East Side, especially. Um, and then you'll also see, so the areas around Hell's Kitchen that I mentioned earlier, Chelsea and some places there, uh, as well as other parts of Midtown and also part of the Upper East Side. So these places were rezoned uh, with the, 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 the United Nations coming uh, to, uh, uh, to, to New York City with uh, the Empire State Building being constructed and then Madison Square Garden, all these places were rezoned. Uh, and and so they 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 weren't uh, as redlined, but places like uh, parts of Upper Manhattan, parts of the Lower East Side, that continued to be the case. Huge swaths of uh, the South Bronx and other places. And so just sort of highlighting that here, uh, just specifically looking at Manhattan. And this here is just one of those. Uh, this is a uh, this is like the uh, area description, uh, looking at one segment. Of East Harlem. So if you look at the clarifying remarks, you'll see where it says, you know, first and second avenues, slum district, mainly very old tenements, uh, very few single homes, mostly converted to cheap rooming houses, includes approach to Triborough Bridge, connecting the Bronx, Manhattan, Queens. East River Drive along the East River may have ultimate benefit. So they were looking at that, but considerable demolition 
uh, ne necessary before the district can improve. Uh, many people would say a lot of the gentrification we see now is a form of demolition, but in, in the sense of demolishing, instead of investing, uh, de taking away the opportunity for people who live there to sort of be a part of it. If you look at another section there, you'll see talking about, talking about um, the clarifying remarks, talking about the business streets, 125th, 116th, Third Avenue, Park Avenue, Lexington Fifth, Negro Slum District, mostly low grade tenements, major part of rentals in low bracket. Uh, you'll see that the availability of mortgage funds for home purchase is none, home building, none. Uh, and these was these were just really, these were these were just built in. And then we move forward to the 70s, and this is where the use of data, the use of of of, of what we call consider evidence. Uh, really needs to come into question on how we think about these things. And so uh, in the 1970s, uh, the city was in a financial crisis. Uh, it was a financial disaster uh, for, for a fairly long period of time. And many of you may have been uh, residents in the city at that time and may even have recollection of that, of that particular era. Um, and one of the decisions that was made was to uh, consult with the RAND Corporation. Uh, RAND Corporation, uh, uh, in the same group that uh, in, uh, advised the government uh, in elements of the Iraq war. Uh, it's a, it's a um, sort of think tank kind of organization that does research. Um, and they, 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 they recommended an algorithm around the use of uh, the, 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 the placement of firehouses. And the algorithm essentially ended up resulting in the, mo the re removing of firehouses from huge parts of the South Bronx Huge, many many areas of Harlem and Upper Manhattan, and many areas in Central uh, Brooklyn. Um, and so, what ended up happening was a lot of fires began to happen, and the response rate and the response times were really really poor. And this resulted in huge areas of these communities being burned down. Uh, and what that resulted in over the course of time was the displacement of 600,000 up to 600,000. Uh, 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 residents into neighboring areas where people were forced to. It was it was it was a truly example of uh, forced migration, and people had to move uh, in with neighbors and with family, and sort of really crowded and congested housing. And I have that the 1977 World Series uh, image there, just because um, it was interesting. This this was uh, folks were watching the World Series. It was it was happening at the Yankee Stadium, um, and the, the, they kept panning the camera out to a huge fire that was going on in the background and sort of referring to it. And, and, uh, and it was just ironic in that moment on the national stage when everyone was watching, these fires were taking place in New York City. And there's an interesting book written by uh, a, a gentleman named Joe Flood uh, that really talks about this and how you know, the use of these algorithms and the use of, uh, of data and some of these other things uh, you know, when mixed in with the right type of biases, uh, lead to these types of, uh, of disasters, the disastrous outcomes for people. And, you know, this here really speaks to when we think of community health, we think of, you know, the, the, we think of um, people and meeting people where they're born, where they live, where they grow, where they go to school, where they play, where they pray, where they age, and all of these things. And it's just, the, the impact of growing up and, and being a, in a community where you see these children playing basketball and trying to fly a kite and doing all these things and doing all the things you see kids doing. We, we want them to be physically active. We want them to be um, engaged in, in their health, in their environment. But this is the environment uh, that they were having to deal with out of the, on the basis of, 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 of policy decisions that were made. And so what's also striking is that uh, when all of that all that overcrowded housing that resulted in uh, from this, um, when HIV hit the city in the 1980s, uh, and of course with HIV came uh, a resurgence of tuberculosis, um, the, 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 the overcrowded areas were particularly hard hit because of the ability, the, the spread of, of TB crowded housing conditions. And indeed with all the cases, we started to see new strains of tuberculosis, and these were much more deadly strains, and it had to become a huge priority for the New York City Health Department and the federal government and others. And you know, um, hundreds of millions of dollars were pumped into this uh, into this effort uh, to, to 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 curb the tuberculosis. Um, but 
it, it just it's just striking how you know when these issues are not addressed here we are in 2020 and social distancing is again a social determinant of health with covid-19 and we're finding the same exact outcomes where people who are in these crowded housing are are, are struggling to be able to um, to be able to, to socially distance and keep healthy and stay safe uh, and do all the things that we know work, but they can't do them because they're not, you know, the, the, the environment that's been created around them. Again, from policies and decisions that were made at a systemic level, uh, these are the things that end up really, so when you're a community health provider, you're working at an FQHC, you're working in a hospital, you're, no, or you're an emergency department, or you are a specialist, you're a subspecialist, whatever the case may be, you might be, you'll be, uh, these are the things that people end up oftentimes seeing, and we, there's no way around it for us uh, in the era, in the in the in the in the field of community health uh, to to not be to not be concerned and to train our efforts to sh to, sh to to push all of our efforts uh, uh, into looking at all of these interconnected uh, issues around policy and systems. Um, so New York City. Uh, is um, uh, divided into 59 community districts. You know, the, the, the 12 in Manhattan in particular, a lot of, a lot of what I have talked about and what I'll be talking about will sort of highlight some of that. Uh, and I think community districts oftentimes uh, have been used as a good proxy for when you're looking at neighborhoods and how you measure neighborhoods, uh, just because a lot of times people, you know, think of their, that's what people are, 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 are attached to you know that you know if you're from East Harlem, you're from El Barrio, uh, you're from Harlem, you're from you know Washington Heights. You know a lot of times those are the things that uh, people associate themselves with when they think of where they come from. But oftentimes, a lot of times, those are also the places where uh, you know racism, uh, systemic racism, is at play, and this and it plays out in those in those same sort of. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a it's it's a it's not a perfect match, but it's a good way to sort of look at some of this. And the city health department puts out an excellent resource, community health profiles. I'm sure all of you are familiar with them. Uh, and for each of the different community districts all throughout the city, these are downloadable. Uh, you can also visit the various data sources themselves and sort of run data and look at different uh, elements of the different aspects of the data and sort of try to you know, research these things. They, they look at not just health outcomes, but also a lot of social outcomes as well. So it's a resource I want to definitely put in a plug for right there. But um, if you look at that information, just sort of see the, 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 the map that we looked at around redlining, the map that we looked at in all these different uh, uh, things around neighborhood health that we just talked about, you'll see that when it comes to life expectancy, uh, you'll see that the, the same sort of map overlays are happening. Uh, when you look at it by different health outcomes, whether it's, 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 it's uh, non-communicable diseases like diabetes or communicable diseases like AIDS or infant mortality or hospitalizations for drug use or asthma hospitalizations which in children, you'll see it's almost the same neighborhoods over and over again. And this, the, 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 what, a lot of what this has to tell us is that it's not biological. When we're seeing these things, these are not biological uh, these are not due to biological differences. These are systemic uh, issues. These are these are not inherent to the people that we're talking about. But these are across the board in all types of ways. And it also um, so if you looked at the, the the map in blue on the left side, it's it's showing where there's a, a shortage of uh, professional primary care professionals uh, in the city. And you will see it's the same sort of northern Manhattan, Lower East Side, northern tip of Staten Island huge areas of central and uh, central and northern Brooklyn, parts of Queens um, that you'll see. And then if you if you map that up against where, um, you know, if you look at where the NYCHA developments are located, you'll see they pretty much cluster in those same areas. And if you looked at where the rates of asthma ED visits uh, are highest in the city, the mapping is, is, is almost exactly over the same thing, uh, or the same areas. And if you looked at uh, poverty uh, levels, and you looked at uh, 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 race, you'd see that these same areas. So the one on the left is looking at the percent of the population living below the poverty line, and the one on the right that's in green is looking at the percentage of total population, which is uh, black or Hispanic. Uh, and you'll see that it maps over the same areas. So as the 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 the, the redlining policies uh, laid the foundation for where uh, 
people of color were clustered. And then people of color experiencing trauma as they were arriving and coming it really as internally displaced persons, right? So when you looked at immigrant health and refugee health, and especially overseas, you know, people who are forced to flee war or forced to flee famine or forced to flee, whatever the case may be, violence of some type, uh, if they don't cross the borders, they're considered IDPs, internally displaced persons. If they cross borders, they become refugees. But these are, you know, a lot of the people, and I just, I highlighted two examples. If you looked at the Puerto Rican population and the waves of migration that happened, there was even a more recent wave following the, 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 the um, hurricanes, that the, the, the waves of hurricanes that hit the island in the last few years. Um, and, and that natural disaster uh, of the hurricanes um, they, they, we, the case could be made that there is, there is a connection to man-made climate change that's driving those 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 uh, disasters. But I think the response to them is absolutely man-made. It, that 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 completely wasn't the outcomes that we saw, and a lot of people were displaced out of that. A lot of people died, underreported deaths, the trauma, the 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 impact of it, the economic impact of all of these things. It is likely to spread for for many generations and for decades, uh, and but also feed sort of the movement of people into neighborhoods. And so, as people arrive and they arrive in these places where they've already been coded and and set up to be places where disinvestment is happening, uh, places where opportunities are, 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 are have been pulled out. And whereas some of the places, so in East Harlem at the 96th Street magical border between the Upper East Side and East Harlem, you know, you see some of these glaring differences. Uh, and you see some of that, if you go to the northern tip of Staten Island and you go uh, to the rest of Staten Island, you sort of see some of what hap what's happening there. Um, and how this, this also plays out now when we're looking at COVID. So what you're looking at here is uh, on the leftmost side, the bright red, uh, is a map showing the seven-day percent positivity and this is from the 1st of February to the 14th of February um, uh, by, by, um, by zip code. Uh, this isn't the community districts, but it's by zip code. And you'll see, again, unfortunately, the same sort of geographical areas popping up. But then if you look at, and when you look at where the deaths are happening, uh, you will see some of that as well. So East Harlem, for example, um, and huge parts of the South Bronx, Upper Manhattan in general. And compare that, if you look at Manhattan, compare that to the Upper East Side, Upper West Side. Um, but then if you look at where the light blue map, the one on the right most, is where the vaccinations, the percentage of the adults who are fully vaccinated, you'll see that it's a complete flip. Uh, and so the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side have the highest vaccinations, a uh, percentage of adults who have been vaccinated in Manhattan. And meanwhile, the places where a lot of the, the, the infections and the deaths have happened uh, are lagging behind. Look at the Lower East Side, Chinatown area, look at Upper Manhattan, West Harlem, Central Harlem, East Harlem, and you'll see some of those things. And then if you looked at the data, and this data, you can find it if you go to the DOHNH, the New York City.gov COVID-19 data page, you'll find this data there. Uh, if you look at it, you'll see if you go by uh, some of these, uh, uh, these, these, uh, uh, these neighborhoods, uh, the percentages are stuck. And this is as of uh, about a week ago, um, the percentage of adults that are fully uh, uh, vaccinated in the Upper East Side is 17% and East Harlem is 6%. Upper West Side is a 12% and neighboring areas of West Harlem are 4%. Uh, Midtown East and Chinatown, you can see the difference there. You can see Forest Hills versus Corona. Corona is one of the places that was hit hard. It was the epicenter of the epicenter last spring. Uh, it was in the news. It was seen around the world. President Trump talked about Elmhurst Hospital and other things. And 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 another another. Um, this this was this is where we first started seeing those bodies and the refrigerated trucks. Uh, and yet, this is that's the vaccination rate that we see. You look at Whitestone versus Jamaica. You look at uh, City Island, which has a six, about 65 percent uh, white population. Uh, there are 25 percent uh, vaccination. And if you look at Mott Haven in the Grand Concourse, Grand Concourse area, we're really looking at like five or six percent. So these are the things. And then, you know, if you look at it by race, um, and, and you'll see by age group and, and broken down by race and age, you'll see uh, that Black and Latino populations continue to lag behind everyone. And I have to say at this point that, uh, you know, the, the, the over-reliance on technology and, 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 and to, to, to get to people, to, for people to be able to um, 
um, uh, enroll, uh, to, to, for folks to be able to schedule an appointment and get, the vac get a vaccination is really, was just a setup for exactly what we are seeing. Uh, there was data that came out in 2019, that was reported in 2019, around the, the percentage of households without internet. Uh, and if you'll see, it's again, the same geographical areas. We're talking about Upper Manhattan, the South Bronx, Central Brooklyn, the Northern tip of Staten Island, the Lower East Side, a lot of the same areas that have been disinvested in and where the big internet companies haven't invested in infrastructure development uh, as they have in the Midtown area, the Upper East Side, Upper West Side, the financial district where Wall Street has to have cracking internet, uh, but East Harlem doesn't have that. And that affects all kinds of things before COVID vaccinations. It affected, you know, just people's ability to look for a job, people's ability to, you know, and now with, 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 with a lot, of, with pretty much all of education moving uh, remotely, this is, has an impact on that too, but it has an impact on businesses, it has an impact on nonprofits, on hospitals, and all of those that are working in these communities. Uh, it has those types of impacts. And so the, the reliance on, on technology, to get a lot of this, uh, uh, the vaccine uh, uh, and, and to do the outreach to communities. Also the reliance on venues like the Javits Center and the Yankee Stadium, that a lot of people that we are trying, we're really trying to reach um, who, who have fallen behind and who have the, the worst burden of disease and who are dying the most, um, those folks don't necessarily go to the Javits Center. Uh, uh, they don't necessarily go to the Yankee Stadium. They're probably not season uh, season ticket holders uh, for the Yankees or the Mets. Uh, and for many, that's not a place that they would go. And sometimes those places, uh, there's a way that people, lower income people, people of color get treated in some of those places. And there has to be a creativity around how we get to people. So, you know, if we're using um, concepts that have been proven, so concepts like mobile vans, other cities are doing these and going door to door and the pharmaceutical companies that are coming out and saying the vaccines they've created, you know, maybe they, they, they don't require the, 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 the strict and stringent uh, freezing uh, uh, storage that, you know, we, we, we've been thinking. But even before they've said that, other places are figuring out how to make it work. Other places are figuring out if we can get um, home delivery of, of medications from pharmacies, under normal circumstances, if we can get uh, vans that go and get closer to, for example, homebound uh, seniors who can't come out to get their vaccinations, but who are extraordinarily, extraordinarily high risk to get this virus and to die from it. You know, there, there's a whole different approach that really the, the, the voice of advocacy has to really speak up to really push uh, for some of these things. We are hearing that the city of Chicago has, is setting aside, a, I think it's a 40, 50% of their vaccine stock and, and, and sending people out door to door trying to get uh, people vaccinated. We're hearing of different approaches that Baltimore is doing and other places are doing. Uh, These this concepts have been proven. Uh, there's no even, an, I'm hearing that the, 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 the state of New York is about to pilot uh, uh, an initiative with four mobile vans. Uh, and that's just, frankly speaking, just not good enough. Uh, four mobile vans in a city of this size and with the, the scale of the, of the problem here, uh, that's just, just, just that's, we're not going to close uh, any gaps with, with, with that type of initiative. There has to be a spectrum of approaches that are different from uh, some of what we've been doing. So that's, I'll, 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 I'll move on from there. So what, what should we do, Com community health? Uh, and particularly I'm thinking we as CSOM, my department, CHASM, all of us, we have to commit to and continue to commit to anti-racist, equity-driven medical education. Uh, we are already doing a lot of this and credit to our students who uh, are committed to this. Uh, we, we, we've, we, I, 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 we've seen the news stories of our student doctors, Ayo and Foyard, who are doing uh, some ex extraordinary work in their communities, addressing medical racism. Um, we should look at our curricula. We should look at our, cost, our courses and really make sure that we are being explicit, make sure that we are being uh, action oriented in the ways that we are uh, uh, educating our, our, our future physicians. We should also part partner with others. E Equal Health is just is a, is a really impressive organization, a global community of social, med social medicine activists uh, who are really committed among many things to sort of driving that conversation in schools and the curriculum and how medical uh, students are educated. So as to really create uh, a, a whole new cadre of, uh, 
of, uh, of equity-driven, equity-focused, equity-committed uh, equity uh, providers. And so really our education mission, we should continue to build on that uh, and, 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 and review and strengthen it, continually finding ways to do that. Um, we should also have an equity-driven research agenda uh, and research that is telling the story as it is. Uh, research that is not uh, quiet about naming racism. Research uh, that is is bringing the evidence to light. Research that is 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 helping to is, is giving ammunition to those in public policy who are committed to making these changes. Our research should be feeding that effort. Our research should be connecting it. So even if we're looking at a specific topic area, say diabetes, uh, you know, there's there's research that we know that has has demonstrated that. The, the uh, issues of housing and neighborhood conditions uh, and the association with uh, diabetes and the same thing with uh, you know, poverty and the same thing, but even uh, research that just really studies and some of my, my former colleagues, uh, Dr. Zinzi Bailey and uh, Dr. Mary Bassett and others who have, done, have written some amazing papers on, on, on structural racism and how it works and specific evidence and interventions around this uh, is really, really important. But I also want to call our student, Dr. Mosley, uh, for, you know, the, we saw the announcement recently, he's making us proud, and I know there are many others. And I also credit the, the, the faculty who mentor uh, and support students who are doing this research, but this is exactly what we should be elevating. These are the things we should be pushing and supporting. Um, the same thing here, just sort of, uh, looking at this, lots of other papers that tie in, for example, internet uh, uh, trauma, the issues of trauma and diabetes. So, you know, intimate, intimate, intimate partner violence, uh, the connection, uh, you know, between, uh, you know, economic status and air, or the, even the connection between air pollution, the whole issue around environmental justice. And we know the connection with childhood asthma, but there's also the connection with hypertension and diabetes. There's just a lot of ways to slice this thing. And uh, uh, the, the focus of our research, we shouldn't miss the opportunity to make these things plain. We shouldn't miss the opportunity to add to the knowledge and make it action oriented so that people can come up, that, that, that information can be used, those findings can be used, that knowledge can be used to advance uh, equity. Um, then how we practice community health, we have to take community health out of the four walls. Community health by definition is outside of the four walls. We have to take it to a place where we are, we are, we are practicing and we are, we are reaching communities, we're engaging communities, we are uh, oriented towards the community and the community is our partner in the work that we do. And um, the, the other thing is we can support and we should be supporting place-based community-led approaches. We know that place-based uh, you know, just based on all the things I've just shared and what many of us already know, this is a very well-established area. So the, the whole idea of neighborhood health um, and just the, 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 the approaches that allow communities to lead, the approaches that take into a, to account the environment, the place in which people are, and sort of really using those to, 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 to um, and supporting those through the elements of work that we bring as community health practitioners. Uh, and again, this is regardless of the specialty you are in. This is, you know, we want our students to feel free, particularly our students of color, feel free to not, if you don't want to do primary care, you don't want to do family medicine, that would be our preference. That would be my personal preference. Uh, but if you're going into these other fields, you know, you can take that and, and transform, uh, be a part of transformational change in those fields as well, which is absolutely needed. The, the research on that, the evidence on that is there and is mounting and is growing. And we definitely need diversity, and we need folk, folks who are who are who are who are driven by equity, driven by justice in those fields. But I just want to—I'm just highlighting here uh, a community health worker initiative uh, that was in the bureau that I led previously. The Harlem Health Advocacy Partners. Uh, these were NYCHA, uh, NYCHA-based uh, uh, initiatives, and it's expanded to additional NYCHA developments. Um, community health workers recruited from uh, the from NYCHA developments. Um, and who, you know, the, the, it wasn't just sort of the health coaching component and helping people access services, but building the capacity to uh, around, joint, around collective advocacy, 
uh, focusing on the high prevalence chronic diseases, but also the social determinants of so food insecurity uh, and all the other, uh, a lot of these other issues and group mobilization, advocacy, community activation was a big thing. And, 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 and we were proud of the fact that uh, different from a lot of community health worker programs, which are linked to a clinic environment, uh, and so the clinic refers community, uh, patients to community health workers who then follow up with uh, the, those patients. The, the, um, this one here, we, we looked for people that have been disconnected from care uh, and people who may not have seen a provider. They may have insurance, maybe they don't have insurance, but they have, you know, connect them, help them get health insurance, help them connect to a primary care provider, and then really help them to advocate uh, for their health, for their care, uh, but then also for the, the other factors, the, the structural social factors uh, that um, impact their health. Um, we've seen where the CHWs in this program, and this is a common feature for community health worker programs, a lot of them went on to study social work. One of them went to medical school. Others have been to you know, various, they, they, they've moved into the healthcare field. Others have started small businesses and so on. And it just, it, it has a, a really empowering effect and it's also a great workforce development opportunity. And the benefits of community health workers is well known, but place-based, community-led, peer-led initiatives. And the, the chart at the bottom of the graph there, the bottom of the slide there shows that, yes, we also achieved uh, improvements in A1C. We, show, we saw, saw improvements in blood pressure control. We saw improvements in you know, a whole host of health and social outcomes. Uh, as a result of this program. It was really, really, uh, and these are statistically significant improvements in outcomes uh, from this program. So it's just an example uh, of just one of the, the sort of initiatives uh, that community health can support. The other thing is we have to lean into community wisdom and community power. Um, we have to be willing to really reassert and reaffirm for ourselves what it is that drives what we do. Uh, we, 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 there's a lot of talk in public health, community health, and healthcare about being data driven, but data comes with its, 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 with, with all kinds of biases in it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an operator dependent uh, a tool, essentially, um, like the ultrasound, the ultrasound tech, you know, the ultrasound, out, the, 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 ultrasound uh, uh, the ultrasound experience in many ways is also uh, operator dependent. But the, the data, the data, uh, the ways that we use data. Uh, and I used the example previously of the firehouses and the disastrous impact that it had on HIV and tuberculosis. And now on COVID, the lasting impact that that has had in these communities uh, is just an example. But I think we have to sort of, we have to, we have to bring balance to what drives us. It can't just be data. It has to be community wisdom. It has to be community power. And as community health practitioners, researchers, all of that, we have to be comfortable with community power. We have to be comfortable with a power structure and a power dynamic that doesn't hold the power in our hands. We have to be willing and comfortable with the shifting of power to community because they know best. They really do know best. And the ultimate power is in the hands of the people. And that is a truth. That is a fact. Uh, and leaning into approaches and strategies that uh, haven't received the same sort of credit and the same sort of evaluation and the same sort of uh, 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 assessment that they should, they deserved and and sort of allowing them to become gold standard practices uh, and so for example I have there you know the, the the free clinics that the Black Panthers used to run the Black Panther Party used to run but they they also had school lunch programs and they had ambulance services and they had a variety of uh, of, uh, uh, of 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 innovations they had innovations around uh, substance use they had innovations around all of these different things that you know oftentimes were dis were dismissed were erased from the literature or not included in the literature and uh, we we have to bust that up we have to be brave enough to to sort of lean into that and and draw on that community input that community wisdom and that community power um, this here is one of the, the um, tools that we found very, very, I found very, very helpful in the course of my work in public health. Uh, really helpful to sort of understand the, the, the stream, the continuum of intervention. So this is the Bay Area Regional Health and Inequities Initiative uh, tool that they use for, uh, for a framework they use for reducing health inequities. And what I like about this really is just the, the depiction, clear depiction of what constitutes downstream and upstream and midstream. 
and sort of really thinking all of the interventions that we are involved with, whether it's in our it's in the the teaching that we do and the practice that are, are, are that we do, or whether it's in the research that we do, moving beyond just the risk behaviors and you know behavior modification and all of these types of things, and really beginning to look into living conditions, lo looking up more upstream into institutional inequities, social inequities, and really sort of and pairing it up with community engagement, civic engagement, uh, strategic partnerships, all of these things where we commit to uh, partnering with others, we commit to a transparent engagement with the community. Um, and, you know, we, 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 uh, we, 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 we move away from, because oftentimes the, the emphasis on, uh, on downstream interventions really puts the onus back on the people who are experiencing the, inequ the inequities. It, it, it's a sort of uh, no better, do better uh, 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 paradigm where you know, we'll just do more education, we'll do more workshops, we'll, we'll, we'll give you more flyers and more handouts and <clears throat> you know, go and do better, you know, stop smoking and you know, socially distance and wear a mask and get vaccinated and all these different things. But you know, we're, 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 we're not acknowledging the bigger holes in the bucket which are the ones that are more upstream? So we need interventions across the spectrum. Uh, you know, we can't completely abandon downstream, and I'm not saying that at all, but I'm definitely saying that we should challenge ourselves whenever we can, because where the inequities, uh, where they, they sort of manifest in those sort of disease and injury outcomes, mortality, and that's a lot of a good place to look to sort of see where the worst outcomes are happening. But if we really we, we challenge ourselves to move back upstream to sort of see where the roots of these things are, I think we'll find uh, that uh, you know they, 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 that's a rich area for us to be looking into from a teaching standpoint, from a practice standpoint, from a research standpoint, uh, and from a community engagement uh, advocacy standpoint. Um, even the whole concept of, of just political power and voting uh, and these types of things, just really thinking about ways in which we engage and connect uh, in all of these things, um, and our students and our, our institution uh, in all of these things. We are not just, we can't just be the ivory towers we heard in a conversation yesterday with one of our partners, but I think it's really thinking about, you know, these are the things that pertain to people. If you really want to have people, you know, uh, doing moderate exercise, 30 minutes a day, five days a week, all of those things we talk about, you know, um, stop smoking, all of these different things, and yet we're not looking at the, 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 the root cause issues behind that. Uh, I think we, we're ineffective, that makes us ineffective. And I'm not just saying us, I think healthcare in general, public health in general, uh, the, the challenge is on. And a lot of people are rising to that and we are too, and we should continue to do that and build upon that. Um, another thing that works, and I know it has its, 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 its uh, you know, we can definitely bring collective impact, many different, you know, there are many reasons why it falls short. Uh, but the point I'm making here is a collective approach, uh, a way where we, 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 we are intentional around collaboration, we're intentional around, and I'm saying, so 360 degree collaborations, so not just you know, researcher to researcher, but researcher and community, uh, community and provider, provider and you know, teacher, teacher and school, school and housing, uh, you know, house, property, uh, a housing development manager, and so on, and just really making those links so that you know we begin to really look at these things uh, uh, in a collective way, and we can swim in the same direction. And some of the key elements of this, and you'll see at the bottom of the slide, I've, built, I've, I've added the bullet of equity. That's uh, one of the big, uh, the big knocks on collective impact is that you know without explicitly making that the, the point of why we're doing it, a lot of times it hasn't addressed uh, uh, equity issues. Uh, but the whole idea of working with communities, working with our environment, the others in our in our community, and I'm using community in a broad sense, around a common agenda, around shared metrics and reinforcing activities that strengthen each other, because it was the same construct that resulted in some in, in the in the in the structural inequities that we see. We saw a common agenda, shared metrics, for example, through redlining and then mutually reinforcing activities. So there was disinvestment of every different kind in all of these different neighborhoods. And it continues to be the case, whether you're looking at broadband, or you're looking at transportation, you're looking at various things, people living in heat bubbles, 
in the Bronx and you know, the impact of climate change being much more concentrated in those areas, uh, the, the number of housing, public housing developments that are right in the middle of flood zones, all of these things were policy decisions that were built and reinforced in a certain way. And, and then, the, then the clustering of people living in those places. So the, the undoing of that should, should include this sort of structure, this sort of element. Now, again, I'm saying I'm not sitting here saying collective impact specifically, but I'm saying this kind of approach. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that we must come at this uh, from a place of humility. Uh, as, as community health educators, community health uh, uh, practitioners, community health researchers, and everything else. You know, this was a quote from the great Angela Glover Blackwell, uh, who uh, was the, lead, the leader of uh, Policy Link for many, many years, um, and just a, a great thought leader in this field. Uh, and she just, she said this, she had this great quote where she said, it is so important for those of you who are beginning to do collective work to know that when you are doing it right, you are just join, you are joining a community that has been waiting for you. Uh, and we should come with that, uh, with that, uh, with that humility. We should come with it in the ways that our students are trained, the way that they practice medicine, in the ways that they um, uh, engage with community, in the way that we as faculty and we as administrators, and so really looking throughout the system. So not just you know, in, the, in the research and teaching and, and all of that, but also in how we conduct business and how we uh, engage as, a, as an institution uh, and really looking at that and, and doing it in a collective way. There is no substitute for the collective if we're really pushing for uh, 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 health equity and we're pushing for social justice. Uh, with that, I wish everybody a um, I wish everybody a, 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 a happy close to the end of Black History Month, and uh, I open the, the floor now to uh, questions. And I thank you for your time and for your attention. I don't know if you all have, yes, thank you. That's what I was gonna ask you all to please clap. <laughs> you know, show some love, make some noise, even though you're muted, because I think that that is just, your presentation was just amazing. I was getting so many messages on the back end, just so you know, just saying, oh my gosh, this is amazing. He's preaching, I feel like I'm in church, all kinds of all kinds of messages, really affirming messages, which I wanted to share with you because I absolutely agree with all the comments that I got. Your presentation was just phenomenal. And I just thank you so much. It was a sobering presentation, but it really highlighted the multifaceted systemic and structural nature of racism and the legacy that it has had on medicine and healthcare inequities. And so I thank you so much for just, you know, just giving us such a real picture. Um, and I, I mean, I'm just so excited. <laughs> and so I now I have um, I'm just going to open the floor up yeah, to questions. We did receive some questions throughout um, in the registration process, but I'm sure that my colleagues and, and community partners and, and, and friends and, um, and peers have questions that they um, that your presentation elicited. So I don't know if um, can microphones be turned on? Sure, I'll do that right away. Thank you, Omar. In the meantime, let me give a shout out to Omar for providing such amazing technical assistance. <laughs> um, he has been yeah, handling my text messages, phone calls, um, and I just really appreciate him. So actually, so while we turn the microphones on, let me just start with one of the questions that we received in the registration, um, during the registration process. So one of the questions we got was, how can our healthcare system improve the current COVID-19 vaccination rollout in our communities? Currently, we're seeing huge disparities of COVID-19 vaccination among ethnic groups and socioeconomic groups. Yeah, great question. Great question. I I, uh, I think a couple of things. At this stage in the COVID vaccine um, rollout, I think the 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 a lot of this is at the federal government level, the state government level. It's also uh, it's also sort of hamstrung right now by the the lack of of vaccine. There's a real shortage of vaccine. But I think what I, I hope that my my slide, my presentation was able to show was even with the, lack, the limited vaccine we have, how it's being distributed is a problem, right? It doesn't match where the people who are getting the most sick, the people who are dying live uh, and who those people are. And so I think the issue is we have to come to terms with the fact, and this is part of that humility, we have to come to terms with the fact that healthcare gets a lot of this wrong. Healthcare gets a lot of this wrong. And healthcare cannot necessarily be continued. We shouldn't continue to trust healthcare just to, to do things and to fix things. We saw the New York Times article about um, 
the, 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 the vaccine center, I think that was associated with New York Presbyterian over in Washington Heights. Uh, and we know that Washington Heights, the population there is largely Dominican. And I think if I remember correctly, the data from a few months ago that I saw was about 64% of that population primarily speaks Spanish, but there was nobody at the site that spoke Spanish. I mean, not even the security guard, not even like just somebody who could, and, and that would even that would have been a very poor way to do it. We would have to sort of really make sure that we, you know, that it's it's built in this, this, this bilingual staff, uh, there's bilingual, bilingual signage, uh, there's opportunities to connect, you know, different ways for people to really uh, access this service. So I think what, hap what should happen is there needs to be a continued uh, support for the support for the 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 folks who are really driving, trying to push an equity uh, an equity agenda here, uh, and really supporting them and really coming out and being able to do it successfully. There are approaches that are being proposed. Uh, I think for me, one of the things I would say is we really need to start moving away from places like the Yankee Stadium and and big old hospitals and things like that. I think as we find out that these vaccines can sustain. Uh, with less of the you know freezing requirements that we thought of the ultra cold freezing requirements that we we thought they required, um, and as as new ones come in which may not even have any of those require, uh, requirements, I think we should start to look at places like dollar stores and give them give them money the ninety nine cent stores and I'm not talking here about you know the chain stores the Dollar Tree and Family Dollar and those places but I'm really speaking more of like the the community the ninety nine cent store. Uh, on 145th Street in Harlem and Adam Clayton Powell and the Grand Concourse in the Bronx and places like that, where you just sort of, you know, they have space and they have refrigeration capacity and they have other things. Help them retool in this period because a lot of people go there and know that they can stretch resources. It's a safe place for them to go when in their poverty, in their lack, they can go there and get what they need. A lot of those folks have never stepped foot in the Yankee Stadium. A lot of them have never been to the Javits Center. And they're not going to go to those places. A lot of them are horrified about having to go to a hospital because the bill that they got, nobody could explain it. And their health insurance wasn't talking to them about it. And all of this just keeps on, it sort of compounds on itself. And so I think there just needs to be a bold new way to look at this uh, and partner with it. There's a lot of infrastructure in the city. We do a lot of the, co the cancer screenings and the Flu shots. We use mobile vans for these things. There are nonprofits that have no mobile vans. There are providers that have mobile vans. Insurance companies, government has mobile vans. Retool these things. Invest in that rather than investing in city fields, which you have to drive to. It's even harder to get to than the Bronx, uh, the Yankee Stadium, which is right up at a, at, a, at a subway station. And but we do these things and then sort of expect that they will suddenly do the job, and then we're surprised when they don't. Uh, but it's almost like a setup. There's no way to do it unless we make we're committed to out of the box thinking. I think part of that is why it's important to build the pipeline. So we have a different set of people at the decision making table uh, who can inform some of these decisions and say, you know what, uh, you know, we go to the Lincoln, we go to the Lincoln Center. People in our social whatever. And I'm not saying us here, but I'm saying you know people that go. Not everyone goes to the Lincoln Center. Not everyone goes to the Javits Center. Not everyone has been down to the yards over there. Not everyone has, you know, these are not places people go and the people we're trying to reach. Uh, and so just sort of being really truthful about that and being committed to doing whatever it takes to get there. Um, and then I think the whole issue of accountability, if you look at the data around health outcomes, and I didn't have the time to add this, but we could have added this. This topic is so huge. We could talk about this. This could be a whole course all by itself. Um, but if you looked at the, the health outcomes data around health institutions, around hospitals. Uh, some of the worst health outcomes exist right around hospitals. The worst outcomes around hypertension and just chronic disease and social inequities and all of these things. And they're just, you know, and then if you looked at the, the track record of sort of the, the predatory practices of collecting uh, payment from low income communities versus other communities by a lot of these same providers, uh, it's really harsh and hostile, and it's really uh, it, they, 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 the communities are targeted in ways that really destroy their economic foundation. That they were already on, on they were all standing on very shaky ground already economically, and so I think it's just there has to be an accountability around some of those things, uh, and and just sort of how we have those conversations and how 
you know, the public can be brought into those conversations. And I think communities that are affected can be brought to those conversations. So I'm sorry, I've sort of wound around my answer to that, but it's, it's, there are many pieces to this thing, but I think part of it is the humility to just know we can't go to the same folks who, under whose control of healthcare, we have had all of these inequities to then be the ones to solve this, to, to sort of be the ones to solve this. Thank you. And so um, now I, I, I think we all have access to unmuting ourselves. Um, so please feel free to ask a question. Otherwise I will go to the list of questions that I um, have that were submitted. I think, I, I think Priscilla, <laughs> oh. Hi, so I, I was wondering when you were showing the data about the disparity with the vaccinations, um, we know that the healthcare um, practitioners, the physicians and the frontline workers were vaccinated first. And I was just wondering how does that, you know, impact the numbers that we saw? Good question. So yes, the, the, the frontline workers in healthcare uh, were vaccinated first and, and, and rightly so, I think that, that made sense. Uh, you know, there were other frontline workers and so a lot of the folks who work in bodegas, the ones who were delivery workers, the ones who were security guards, the ones who, you know, a whole variety of other uh, folks who were essential workers, particularly at the time when we had to lock down, uh, those folks have not received vaccines at, that, at the same level. I think there are various categories that have begun to, to where this has started to happen, I think in the last several, in the last few weeks, uh, I think we know at the beginning of February, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was early February, uh, grocery workers, for example, and restaurant workers could get vaccinated. But I was on a community call, uh, I was presenting on a community call where uh, restaurant was particularly for, and it was, it was specifically for um, community, uh, restaurant workers and grocery workers. And they said, and these were folks in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, and they went to the Yankee Stadium and were turned away and they were told they were not eligible. And this went on, went on for days and days and days. Uh, and, you know, just for them to break away from work to be able to get that vaccine is not a thing they can just keep coming back for, uh, especially if they've had to push through the process of even getting uh, an appointment and all of those types of things. And so it's really looking at it's just the, how the whole thing operates uh, in some instances. And this is part of uh, structural racism is services just don't function as well uh, in poor communities, in communities of color. And we've seen that even regardless of income, they just don't work as well uh, for black and brown people in particular, but some immigrant groups as well uh, and indigenous people, certainly. Uh, so I, I think the, the, the teasing out there of who the frontline workers was, uh, is important. I think the and 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 I think we we also want to make sure that our our, our frontline workers who are the work the ones who work at the registration desk when you come into the emergency room, the ones who are the ones that deliver food in the rooms of patients, the ones that are you know the ones that clean the facilities, the ones that are doing all this work, the security guards, all of those people are also getting the vaccination and not just some. But I think that the focus starting out with those folks was great. Uh, but I think what we're seeing the gap is all the other essential workers who are essential at a certain time and maybe not now, maybe the lockdown isn't at the same level, uh, but they carried us through, they carried us through at that time. And they should, re they should receive uh, vaccinations, particularly the low income frontline essential workers. Thank you. So I think, um, Kilaris, you wanted to ask a, a question? Yeah, it's a little bit of a loaded question. So um, yeah, feel free to, spin it um so for the last year um public schools uh have had uh have tried to create a, a reopening plan um for our students uh, new york city public schools mostly serve black and latinx students um and we're seeing that about 75 percent of the students have not gone back to in person uh, we've also seen that white students are um, overrepresented in that space. Um, we're seeing that mostly black and brown families are keeping their children at home. However, they're also the ones that have the highest levels of students with individualized education plans, English language learners, and come from our most vulnerable communities. The city continues to say that schools are safe. Um, however, some of the metrics that other folks have looked at, like Dr. Jen Jennings um, and some of the advocacy groups I work 
for and with um, are showing that 50 percent that teachers are more, are 50 percent more likely to get COVID if they're inside schools. Um, with all that being said, if you were at the forefront of thinking of an equitable reopening plan for our schools, who would you prioritize? Um, and how would you incentivize our teachers to um, get the vaccine? Great question. It's, it's, a, it's obviously a very um, a complex issue. Um, I think behind all the metrics and all the data and all the, you know, the policies that we're seeing, you know, there's obviously there's evidence driving uh, driving that, but there's also politics behind a lot of this. We know that our school systems are very political environments, uh, and sometimes, you know, in ways that are, you know, end up muddying the waters around a thing like this, right? And so, I would just say that um, the the some of the data that I'm aware of uh, indicates that uh, the rate of of COVID, the the, pos the percent positivity of COVID in schools uh, is at about 1%, uh, which is way, way, way lower uh, than a lot of, like to just the general population. Uh, overall, it's coming down again, thankfully, we're, in the right, we're moving in the right direction statewide, citywide. Uh, generally, there's still some places that have obviously higher rates than others, and those inequities uh, continue to be a problem. Uh, but in terms of the schools, I think we've, the, the, from what I've seen and what I've heard, I think the, the rates are, low, uh, are not as high as would be expected. And I think part of this is the initial reopening uh, was around sort of middle school. It wasn't really the high schools as such. And I think the younger children apparently uh, are more likely to just sort of go along with the instructions and wear their masks and sort of you know, follow the rules uh, as opposed to maybe the older teenagers or whatever. But I would say, I think the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the impact the impact on education, the impact on social learning, social emotional learning, and all of these things is really, is a real problem. It's a real challenge. And I think society is fixing to be really harsh, you know, for the kids who ended up having these gaps. Uh, society, you know, just sort of like, you know, we have these rules where, you know, if you just don't cut it, you don't cut it. Like it's just, it's un they're just unfair systems and policies outside. Just when we're thinking about post-education, when people are trying to get a job, people are trying to get housing, people get health care, people get health insurance and how they're able to access it. Um, these gaps that we're seeing in education, I think are going to manifest issues down the road. And so for me, uh, I am, I, I, it's, it's, it's a challenging issue, but I, I feel like if, if, if we can safely start to get kids back in there, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think I'm okay with it. Uh, I think these reasons why uh, communities of color, uh, the parents there are less likely, our parents are less likely to want to send their kids back. And I think many of us have those feelings. Uh, but I, the, 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 we, have to, we have to engage with parents to understand how we can address those. So there's also literature out there just non-COVID related where there's, there's papers and people have written about, you know, black and Latino parents are less likely to engage in parents' associations, are less likely to do this and less, and it's it's very blaming of those parents. Uh, it doesn't. There's, there are some people that have looked into racism into in how discrimination plays a factor in how people just don't want to come and be engaged with that type of experience. And 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 some of it is implicit, and some of it is explicit, and just the ways that people end up having those experiences. So we have to have a, a really again a commitment to addressing those concerns that our parents have uh, so that we can, can, can reassure them really and meaningfully, actually, uh, in ways that will allow them to feel more comfortable sending their kids. Because it, it, I think the, 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 the damage done to our children is, 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 is a problem. I think it's a concern we all have. Uh, then I also, you know, I completely understand, I was recently speaking with a, a group of um, union workers. This was SIU, it wasn't the teachers unions, but speaking with them and they have concerns as well, home health aides and others, you know, uh, but the, 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 I, I'm not sitting here blaming union, uh, teachers unions for any of this. I think there has to be sort of bringing all the players together to really be able to come to an understanding of how to move forward uh, and uh, and being being respectful of of the concerns that the parents who we most want to bring their kids back in, why it is that they have those reservations, um, we have to really be you know, you know frank with them and then address those issues frankly to the extent that is they're addressable in the short term. 
But if, you know, we should be addressing them anyway, um, because those issues are also why, like I mentioned, they don't, you know, their st studies are that, you know, they may be less likely to be engaged with parent associations and with the schools and with teachers and things like that. I think it's just all tied in. If you've had these experiences, same with healthcare, same with housing, if you've had these experiences of discrimination, interpersonal discrimination, but you look around and it's all the people that look like you, uh, it's just, you just, it's just not there for you. Uh, and we have, if these are public good services, we must make them work for everyone. Yeah. Okay, so it is 6.32 and I recognize that it is a Friday evening <laughs> um, and some of you may want to get on with your weekends, but I just thank every single one of you for showing up and for being here to honor the legacy of Martin Luther King. And I, most of all, I just want to say thank you to our speaker, Dr. Noel Mayendo. I, you know, again, let's clap for him and we can make some noise. Let's make some noise for emojis or whatever it is. I, I hope that you, you know, I'm going to save the chat, um, Dr. Mayendo, because uh, there's a lot of affirming messages there that I would like you to thank read. You. Um, so, um, you know, thank I you. appreciate you and thank you so much for just kicking off this lecture series on such a high note. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, everyone, and have a great and a safe weekend. Take care.